Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's Way Forward Workshop Leader Lunch Break. We are so pleased to welcome Jim Kobaki to our conversation. Jim has dedicated his life to leading in educational institutions at both secondary and at the collegiate level. He served as the president of St. Ed's, principal at St. Ed's and Eastside Catholic in the state of Washington, and as associate dean of admission at Princeton. And lest you think his talents are limited to the halls of education, he's also been a football coach at Harvard and at Fordham. In all of these leadership roles, he has served multiple constituencies, the institutions at large, faculty, alumni, administrators, students, parents, athletes, recruits, funders, and the community members. There are few in leadership roles who need to tread so boldly, yet so delicately, to listen to and meet the needs of so many diverse audiences. Over four decades, he has honed his leadership skills through an open mind, an open heart, and always a thoughtful presence. He has mentored dozens of teachers and students and given generously of his time to serve as a big brother in the community. His 12 years of leadership at St. Edward High School are coming to a close this summer. His time has been marked with instituting the International Baccalaureate Program at St. Ed's, making sure that his students could take advantage of vouchers, and seeing St. Ed's named as a blue ribbon school. His parting gift as he steps away from his public facing positional leadership role is his book, Choose to Lead. It highlights the hallmarks of his leadership, courage, integrity, generosity, empathy, competitiveness, and always humor. Jim is a proud alum of Leadership Cleveland and he has a pretty strong support contingent from Leadership Cleveland on the call today. Jim, thank you for joining us. Thanks, Marianne. I appreciate that. That sounds really, I just wonder who you were talking about. Um, am I shared yet, Rachel? Okay, I gotta do that. And how's that? We good to go? Looks good. Great. Well, I'm gonna try and cover a fair amount of ground, so I'll try and be as, uh, as fast as I can so we have time for some questions. But um, uh, again, really appreciate you having me here. And I love talking about uh, education. I love talking about leadership. And the book kind of fell out into really four different uh, themes, if you will. Uh, personal leadership, organizational leadership, uh, visionary leadership, and operational leadership. So I'm going to kind of touch on those and then finish at the end. So the personal, you know, it depends, obviously depends on what age you are, but I think we're always talking about in our, in our minds about, uh, you know, how we're doing and, and how we should be leading. But you have to decide what you think a good leader looks like, what you think your own qualities are that you're going to bring to bear. And I always like to use the phrase that I think I get tired of hearing around St. Ed's is that first we model. So if you if you just keep that in mind, you are always modeling. People are watching. So you're modeling the culture. You're modeling the mission. You are modeling leadership. You are modeling anything else that that uh, is involved with your, your community. Um, there's a great line, you know, students hear what they see. Um, and so, so if you're conscious of that, I think you'll be off to a good start. That's kind of my overriding one. The second overriding one is that leaders come in all sizes, you know, all personalities. I'm an introvert. Um, but what, what would all good leaders, in my view, share is authenticity. Uh, you can only lead by who you are and who you are will become who you lead. So you really need to think a little bit about uh, you know, what is it that makes you you and makes you want to lead? Uh, and believe me, it's, it's important to have leaders out there. I love the book Mandela's Way. I'm a fan of uh, obviously Nelson Mandela and Richard Sengel uh, wrote about different principles that, that Mandela had. And the one was have a core principle and everything else is tactics. I think there's a lot of truth in that. A lot of what we do is tactical. Uh, core principle for me is the sense of to lead you must serve. And that gets me to James Hunter, who I still think wrote the best book on servant leadership uh, called uh, um, The World's Greatest Leadership Principle, How to Become a Servant Leader. Uh, and, and you start with this sense that you must serve. And again, why are you serving? Well, you know, I believe you serve to make a difference, right? You're trying to influence people in a positive way. Uh, you're trying to make your institution better. You're trying to educate. We're trying to transform the lives of young men in, in our school. Um, so, so, um, so why are you doing this? And I think, again, 
you have to have a servant attitude. Um, a good way that he summed that up, by the way, I'll just read a, a couple because you'll, you'll recognize this. Uh, he found all the great qualities he thought of servant leadership in, in 1 Corinthians, which you, you often hear at weddings, right? Uh, so I substituted uh, the word leadership. And if you start with leadership is patient, leadership is kind, leadership is not jealous, leadership is not pompous, leadership is not inflated, and on and on, uh, I think you find it actually works. Uh, and it's a great way to kind of approach your, 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 uh, your leadership, because again, it's all relational. You know, that's what the, the theme is here. Um, we don't retreat at St. Ed's because we really believe that our job is to create the next generation of servant leaders. And so I would often give the, uh, the initial talk and I'd ask the kids to close their eyes and I'd say, okay, now I want you to imagine a leader who you admire, living or dead, I don't care who it is, but somebody you admire as a leader. And then now think of a quality that person possesses that you think makes that person an effective leader. And it was always a fascinating exercise. Then we'd write all the, all the words on the board and invariably what came out was it was a character trait or a skill. And the beauty of that is both can be developed. So uh, Hunter often talks about leadership as character in action. And so uh, as, as Marianne mentioned, I think I forgot to tell you, Marianne was humility was the third one and I caught that. Uh, and probably the best one, by the way, because I think uh, there's a great quote I have that says that uh, only the humble uh, can achieve excellence since only the humble can learn. Um, so, so you have to decide what character traits you think are important to you to help you be a good leader. Um, I've listed mine here. And the other is the skill set, which again is developed over time. And uh, I try to summarize it in three different groupings. Uh, the first is leadership you project, right? You're head cheerleader. So you've got to be that positive force out there. Uh, you've got to have the energy. I'm not a rah-rah person, to be honest with you, but I try to be positive and optimistic. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to say, I don't know, I don't have all the answers, but I'm pretty sure we'll figure it out one way or another. <laughs> so, so you have to project that kind of optimism in, in, in if you want people to follow you. And frankly, leaders need followers. Uh, the other is a sense I call level leadership. And I think that's important. It just happens to fit my personality and some of my background. Um, but uh, you can't be nice one moment and flying off the handle the next. You can't roll up in a ball and, 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 and or make excuses. You know, you've got to project a certain level, consistent uh, leadership style to the people around you. Um, so they, they can, you know, if you can't operate in an inconsistent or uh, out of whack balance and you lead that, you model that obviously. Leadership and practice. I think this is the one that you probably would work on more over time. It's really a decision-making process. And I think the only thing there is to really focus on it as every, every problem is brand new. You have to be fresh eyes. Uh, you have to have the initiative to really want to delve into things. You have to have an, an analytical ability. I think that's the most fun to try and figure things out. And then judgment is kind of how you how you determine where you're going to go. And decisiveness is why you're hired. So so you're going to have to do those things. I love Colin Powell's uh, uh, way approach to this, where he said if you if one is no uh, information and ten is full information, uh, he said if you make a decision at one, you're probably an idiot. That's my phrase, not his. Uh, if you make it a 10, you might miss the boat because a lot of times things are often gray and you don't have complete information. And he sort of said, well, between four and seven is where you should probably make a decision. And that's where judgment comes in. So, so that's something, obviously, as you go through life, you're going to get better at the more chances you have to, to, to try and analyze things and, and decide on things. So uh, that just comes with the territory. And then leadership, you communicate. I think it's really important not to... Um, uh, underestimate your writing, your speaking, anytime you have that opportunity, you're selling, you're, you're presenting the mission, you're presenting what you're about, you're presenting where you're going. And so take that very seriously. I always prepare. Uh, listening is obviously a great skill if you want to be a good leader and you work with people. Um, and vocabulary is critical. I think you should have a shared vocabulary, which we do around the academic side of this life. But I also think it's important how you choose your words. I constantly hear my faculty, my board, my, 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 my students. And, and I you think, say, our faculty, our board, our students. Just think of the way that sounds and what you're presenting to people. Or I like to use the word opportunity against challenge. Um, you know, challenges are great, but sometimes they tire you out. Opportunities are great. Hey, this is an opportunity. So I think, I think word choice does matter. Um, the next one is organizational. Now, you're the head, you're the CEO. And too many people uh, get caught in the weeds. And I think you have to keep the big picture in mind. I think there are six key things to the big picture. Uh, the only way I can actually say I've improved our school is by who I bring on board. 
So that's where you spend the time, get the right people, take the time to get the right people. The second one is culture and mission. I think in a school like ours, culture and mission are synonymous, uh, but mission has to be that, uh, I always call it the bat sign. A lot of people call it the North Star, but it's like the Batman series, right? If you have your mission in the sky and people are looking at that, I always tell our faculty, if it agrees with the mission, make, make a decision, right? So, so it's sort of that overriding guidance that that's what we're there for. Excellence, we're in a very competitive world and, uh, and, and we have to compete and excellence has to be the standard. Um, more importantly, I think it's upon us to prepare our kids to have the best skill set, right? And so excellence is important to them and how we train them. So, so I think excellence is always top of mind uh, when you're trying to, to run a school. The revenue streams, you know what? If we have tuition and we have fundraising, and if you don't get those two right, you go out of business. So as head, you better kind of have your, at least your ear to those. And, and obviously in fundraising, you'll probably spend a lot more time in that. Educational process, you don't necessarily have to guide it, but you have to have a working knowledge of curriculum, pedagogy, and assessment, which are the building blocks of education. Um, and, and again, the longer you're in the business, the more you'll get. And then I think some people miss that you really have a public base of the community. You know, I think you need to develop relationships. That's why Leadership Cleveland has been so great to me. Uh, develop relationships, leverage those relationships so that you really get your school out there. I, wanna, I want Santa to be a beacon in Lakewood, in Northeast Ohio, in Ohio, and ultimately in the country. So I think those are the six you have to keep top of mind. So you're really thinking big picture all the time. And then it's always about key relationships. And there are several that I discussed in the book, but the two main ones are board chair and head and head and principal or whatever the second in command is at your school. Um, those two are really critical, critical relationships and they have to be done well. Um, the visionary, um, I always think it's the head's job to be constantly peeking over the horizon, right? Again, my job is to figure out where it's going. So where, where is education going, but where's is, where is life going so that we can get there first, we can anticipate the future, figure out what our students need to, to, to create their world, frankly, and, and then go out and develop that. So it's that kind of the mindset is that endless curiosity. You know, you're just constantly reading and looking and going and trying and, and trying to learn. Um, and then create a vision, you know, that sort of the Collins, what are you best in the world at? We want it to be the best of the world in three, at the intersection of three circles. Uh, the values, uh, college prep habits of mind, you have to write well, speak well, present well, listen, ask good questions. Um, and then teaching the future. We spent about a year and a half, there were about 15 of us that met every Monday for a year and a half to try and answer the question, what does a program of innovation look like? And we finally decided after a lot of great discussions and not getting anywhere, that what we really wanted was a culture of innovation. And we defined innovation, it's the, it's the Harvard Business School definition, new and useful. Because as soon as you say innovation, a lot of people go right to technology. And, and innovation isn't technology, innovation is innovation, right? What's new and what's useful in your sphere, whatever you're doing. And we developed these nine strands that we think are more important for the future. Uh, I'm not gonna go into right now. I can certainly answer questions on that in a minute. Um, and here's the schematic. So as we looked at it, Holy Cross is our, our, our order. Holy Cross gospel values is a Catholic term. Um, provides students a foundation of faith values and a moral compass. If you don't have a moral compass, I don't think it matters what we teach you. Uh, college prep, appreciation for all life has to offer and the skills to access it. And then teaching to the future is where we say we'll empower our students to create the world in which they will live, work, and serve five, 10, 15 years from now, because that's when they're gonna be, uh, that's when they're gonna be really in their, in their full uh, uh, um, uh, work, uh, workforce mode. The fourth is operational. And again, it's just the craft of, of, of leadership in your arena, right? So what are the nuts and bolts of execution you have to get right in, in education, private education, independent education, governance is critical. How do you work with the board? How do you work with the chair? That can go sideways in a heartbeat. And you really have to have a real uh, honest, open discussions with, with the folks around you on that one. I always tell folks to leave your ego at the door, whether it's our folks or board members or whatever, just say, look, nobody gets extra credit for being right. St. Ed's has to be right. So it's not about you, it's not about me, it's about St. Ed's getting it right. And if you do that, people respond pretty well. I talked about resource development, obviously most of that's fundraising and admissions. Uh, you just have to be attentive to those. Uh, finance, you know, we don't, we, we work in a very finite world. Uh, we never sit around and say, hey, what are we gonna do with all this money? Uh, we are constantly trying to prioritize and, and move our school forward while still managing our budget. And so I'm very fortunate to have 
wonderful people around me uh, at Saints in all these areas, but but certainly in finance, uh, we actually actually have to be in the black. Um, legal, uh, you know, that's just the way of the world. Um, I always sort of half kid that if I was going to apply for another job as a head, the first question I'd ask is, who's your lawyer? I probably talk to lawyers every week, maybe every two weeks if it's a good day. Um, safety, and again, this day and age, you have to be very acutely aware of that. And then crisis management, when you're in a social media world, you really have to have a crisis plan, a crisis team, and I think crisis training because people know right away. And so you want to get out in front of things so that you're sharing information with your families uh, instead of the media. And when you do that, no matter how bad it is, at least you're out front of it and you're being honest with people and, and being up front and getting there first. So I think that's critical. And then I sort of said, okay, what are some of the things that I would look at just in conclusion that maybe are sort of things I think are important, uh, the differentiators. I think too many people are managers. You know, they think if, if they manage the job well and everybody's where they're supposed to be, that you're doing a great job. And that's kind of not true. Um, you know, you better be, you better be looking down that down the path and over the horizon and really trying to constantly spend your time and, and and it's a fun way to spend your time by the way and then competitiveness i just think i'm a naturally competitive person <laughs> so you know you go out of business if you don't if you don't compete um but you can't be a one-trick pony either you gotta have you know you gotta have everything a family wants so if they want if they want uh, uh volleyball or if they want english or if they want service whatever they want uh we have to provide and be good at it um, I get back to people, like I said, everything's about relationships. You develop trust, trust because of your authenticity. Um, so that's why it comes full circle. I do think it's important to, 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 to be a good leader uh, when you're looking for leaders. Um, can they judge talent? You know, are they good at picking people uh, and then developing young talent? I think if you have that skill, and I've seen some of that a lot and then some of our folks, but that's really effective. Uh, Chris von Nossinger, I was a... a uh, my executive coach in Seattle is wonderful. He wrote a very small book called Shift One to Many. And so what he said was, um, it, when, you, when you start your career, you get recognized because you outwork everybody, right? You're just kicking butt, you, you know, you're working hard, people recognize you, you get promoted, you get accolades. But as you become a leader, that shifts to where now your accolades and your celebration is about the people around you. You're celebrating your team. And, and think about that because, you know, five people or 10 people are going to do a lot more work than one person, right? So it just makes all the sense in the world. The takeaway for me was that if you have that ego, um, it could be hard to give up that power, right? Because people are going to say, well, what do you do? You know, because oh, you're praising all these other guys all the time. Um, so I think that's really important to, to think about and self be self-aware. You know, I have to give up my power and my accolades to really celebrate the wonderful people around me because collectively we're gonna do so much more work than I would be as an individual. Uh, courage or convictions, just to frankly, that's what I define courage. It was, I, I'm, I hesitate to use courage, but it's really courage or convictions. People have to know that, you know, you're gonna, you're gonna do what's right. You're gonna, you're gonna do what's right. It never would expedient, period. You just, you know, they can count on that. That'll develop trust. And then when you talk about the educational landscape, I think values are timeless. I think, frankly, we probably need to talk again about our values as a society and, and as, as citizens of this country. Um, but but you gotta you gotta hand you gotta educate kids on values. Um, but then how you educate is timeless, right? Because again, the world's going so fast, and you have to be looking ahead all the time. So that's a pretty quick summary. I hope I did okay on that. Um, felt that time pressure, um, but uh, and then there's my my uh, contact information uh, if you'd like to do that. Also, my wife's online, Amy Kubaki. So, uh, uh, Amy at choose to leadorg as well. But um, so, how about if I stop there? Is that is that a good place to stop? That's great, Jim. And we've had a couple questions come in, so okay. we will start with: Are there any strategic high school or college courses that you suggest for leadership development as? we have individuals and students coming up and looking to be leaders in their career? Um, for students, um, that's a very interesting one. Um, you know, we've done a good job with, with, uh, with James Knight uh, here. Um, and what, we, what we're using is the term cultural humility. And it really can go to any discussion, but it really is centered around DEI, but it can be any discussion of relationship, right? That if you, if you adopt the, um, adopt the position of a learner uh, that I could go to you and no matter who I'm talking to and say, now, who are you again? And explain to me, you know, where do you come from? You know, instead of making any 
kind of false assumptions about people. So James's work is really taken off. Uh, he wrote a book called Heart. I think it's called The Journey to, uh, to, uh, to Cultural Humility. Um, but I just read a lot of books on, on leadership. You know, I just kind of love leadership. I, 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 we, make, we have our students read The Servant, right? Uh, so Hunter wrote an allegory. It's a story that gets at servant leadership. And then he went back and wrote a book about servant leadership. So the first one is called The Servant. Uh, ninth graders is probably a little heavy, but we, we do ask our, our ninth graders to read it. And then, like I said, I use the book that, that I mentioned. I think he's great and captures my, my idea of what leadership is really, really well. Does that answer that question? It does. Thank you. So any advice for someone guiding an organization into a new phase, whether that's getting people sold on your vision, leading in a new way in the same organization, or managing change at the board level? Oh, there's a whole mouthful there. Um, I think it depends where, where you want to start. Um, the, the, um, the first part of that, because I had a thought and I, and I lost it when you said something else was, uh, uh, I, you know, again, I use the word, I don't use the word change. I just don't. I think people re react negatively to it. Um, one of the other principles in the Mandela book is that you have to lead from the front and lead from the back, right? So, so there are times when it's really important, like I said, to, to really lead from the back and, and collaborate and, and really develop your talent and let them lead because that's how you're going to get you know a, build a bench down the road but sometimes you have to be the point person i think if it's a big challenge if it's a if it's a real like i came in saying as i wanted to do the international baccalaureate i'd studied it at princeton and i wasn't able to implement it in seattle for various reasons we were building a whole campus for one but um so i wanted to do it here and so I literally came to the board and said, look, I can study this for a year, but I, I, I want to probably be, and I happen to have a guy that I was connected with who was phenomenal, uh, and I have no money. And they said, well, okay, this is before I even started, by the way, it's like in April, I wasn't going to start until July. And they said, okay, uh, we'll do it. So a bunch of board members put up 150 grand. I hired Greg, and he was a superstar. Um, more importantly, uh, you have to get trained in international baccalaureate, right? And because it's very specific, we trained 25 people. You know, if I really want to do it just like as an AP thing, I would have probably done six teachers that were the senior level, right? But I want to do it pedagogically. I wanted everybody in our school to share that vocabulary because I love the approach to how they teach kids. I think it's the future. Um, so we trained 25 that first summer. And, and it's going to sound crass, but, you know, if you didn't like it, if you didn't think it was a good idea, you kind of just got run over. So I think sometimes you have to stand up and say, this is where I think we need to go. Uh, obviously, you want to work with the board to make sure that, <laughs> that they believe you, you know, they're backing you. Um, but because um, those are important relationships. Um, but 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 I think, you know, you, you, that leadership is a it's a push me, pull you kind of thing. Right. I mean, there are times you just have to be out front and say, look, I believe this is what we have to do. This is where it's going. I did my homework and I'm pretty confident that we can do this. And here's where here's where I think we need to be, whatever that may be. Um, I, I always believe in great conversations and discussing all kinds of things, but at some point you have to decide where you're going and, and how you're going to get there. And again, it, it, it's not that simplistic, right? Because you, you have to bring people with you, but, but that's where relationships are, are really important because it's important to, to, to have the confidence of people. That's probably a convoluted answer. But. So as you're working to develop others, how do you integrate succession planning into that development? Succession plan for them? Um, that's a really interesting question. I'm not sure where I'm su they're succeeding to. Um, I did a succession plan for our school with one of our board members, right? So, so what are the qualities? I had a list of qualities. There's, some of this kind of came out of that. What are the qualities? What are the, what are the, what are the demands of the position, right? What are the top 10 things that I do uh, if you're ahead? And then what are the qualities you need? So I actually did that. And then you're supposed to identify people. I think this is more to the question. Uh, and, and sort of say, okay, where are they on this continuum so that you could develop them into becoming a head, right? I think maybe that's the way the question was meant to be asked, an, uh, answered. So, so we did do that. So I had, you know, here's some young talent. So I had a great guy who's frankly going to take over for me. Um, didn't have a whole lot of certain experiences, right? He had great experience, but certain areas he didn't. So I'd try and slip him some stuff that looked more like development, you know, and stuff like that. Um, and just talk to them a lot about it. So, so I think you can, uh, you know, when you have talented people, you know, the hardest thing is, the hardest thing, by the way, I think I'll write a whole chapter next time on this one is what do you do when somebody gets, you know, you know, somebody comes after your people, right? Because um, A, I don't want people nobody wants. 
Um, but then you're kind of caught because I really love this person. But on the other hand, I got to do what's right for this person. So I, I have, a, I do a lot of counseling. My background's in counseling. And uh, I, you'd have to be honest with people, right? I said, look, I, I always looked at stuff. So if some of our people come to me and go, look, I've been asked to talk to somebody. I go, go talk. You know, if it, if it turns out to be the best thing ever, then good. Now we have a, you know, I have a tree. Um, you know, that's a, not a bad thing. But if it, you may, it may also tell you why you like being here. You know, and I've had that happen to me, but it's kind of a tricky one to have, but you got to put the other person's interests at heart, right? I mean, because again, they've been great to you. They, they, they're people you invest in. You can't be disingenuous. You know, I care about who's with me and I care that they progress in life. So if they get opportunities, uh, I want them to look at them. I, I sometimes I die when they leave, but, but you know, but it's, it happens. So what, uh, you know, life goes on. Any specific recommendations you can offer on how you do identify, encourage, and inspire that those future leaders to become engaged? Whew, that's an interesting one. Um, yeah, Greg Good, who ran our who developer IP, hit a real good deal for that. Um, you know, I think it's just when I, first of all, in the interview process, I probably interview a lot more people than most because I think it helps you figure out what you want. <laughs> you know, I, I hear this, you know, everybody's kind of got a range of stuff. And it kind of helps you flesh out what you believe, right? And so, so that process alone is good. So then you know you've got good people. Um, I just talk to them informally a lot. I have a lot of discussions with some of our folks when they're just coming in here, you know, in the middle of the afternoon, hanging out, you know, just not ad nauseum, but, you know, where, where you just have some time and you just kind of sit down and kind of go, what's going on? I had one person who just left and we talked for two years about where he was going, very talented. And, you know, he always had this thing about the homeless in his head, right? He always had this thing about the homeless. Finally, the right job came up. And I said, you know, good for you, Liam. You know, I hate, hate to lose him, but he'll do wonderful work with the Coalition for the Homeless, right? So I think it's trying to get, you know, it's just relationships, right? I mean, again, you, you, it's all, it's everything we do is relationships. So, it's, it, you know, if you like and care about people, then I want to help them get where they need to go and or help them figure out where they need to go. I can't tell them where they need to go. But I can certainly help them, give them experiences, you know, that maybe they're, they're lacking um, so that they, they'll be, you know, people were always great to me when I was coming through the ranks, right? And I really appreciated that. So I want to be able to, to pay, pay that forward a little bit, a lot, actually. What do you feel is the most important leadership quality to pass on to the next generation? Boy. Um... Well, my Angela said courage because none of the other qualities can happen unless you have courage. Um, so, uh, you know, I love humility because I think humility uh, will help you learn um, and be a learner your whole life. So I think probably the biggest factor in my life has been my willingness, my, not my willingness, but my just, uh, you know, I'm, I was like a decent student, you know, in the old days and I did my homework and I did all the, you know, all that stuff, but I, I'm much more curious now and I study and study and study. I've read every leadership book probably there is um, and I continue to. And so, so I think if you have humility, um, human, you know, I can see it when somebody thinks they know all the answers and I just wait for them to sort of not know the answer. <laughs> <laughs> it usually happens. Um, yeah, I'll say, I, I, I would keep coming back to the moment. I mean, I just think it's, you can't learn unless you're humble. You can't learn from mistakes unless you're humble. You know? So we have time for one more question. And very curious, what's next for you? What are your post-retirement aspirations? Well, uh, we, Amy and I say we're transitioning. We're not retiring, um, which she didn't like this answer, but I said I'm too bad a golfer to retire. Um, you know, I want to stay engaged, and the book is kind of like a calling card, right? It's sort of like, here's what I believe in, in an ideal world. Amy's got a wonderful background in development. She's been a fundraiser for 35 years, by the way, really knows her stuff. Um, and so if we could, if, if I could coach young heads, it would be probably the perfect world, you know, just control a little bit more of my time. Um, when you do this job, the job is harder than it used to be, partly because of the climate. I don't think because of COVID. I think because of the climate. Well, COVID a little bit, but mostly because of the climate in the country. People are just not courteous to each other and they don't, you know, the respect isn't there that used to be. And see, that's where you got to get back to the humility. But um, so I think that's what we'd love to do. We'd love to keep engaged in the, in the, in the, um, in the world of education. You know, you've, you've done it for so long. You, you know, I have young people around me here. I've got young, you know, nephews and stuff. 
that you just kind of say, you know, what would I tell them? Well, how could I help them? You know, maybe flatten the curve a little bit. There's no, there's no substitute for experience, but if I can flatten the curve so you can avoid some of this stuff, um, that'll be great. You'll make your share of mistakes. We all do. Um, so it's, it's more of that. If I can help coach, I'm a coach at heart, right? That's my, my background, as you heard. By the way, Mary, I do think coaching is education. So it sort of made that sound like it was an education. Um, so anyhow, um, appreciate you allowing me to talk. I felt like I was rushing, but I hope it was useful. Um, and if anybody has any follow up, you know, we're around and we're always available. So happy to chat anytime. Well, Jim, thank you so much. And we will be sure to share out your website and your email afterwards so folks can follow up and learn more. Uh, and we certainly appreciate your time today. And that's the end with the book. Right. Mary has to do better than I did. So here you go. So uh, and I, see you a lot of, I see a lot of friends on here. So thank you all. I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks so much, Jim. Um, this has been an absolutely fascinating discussion. While you may be stepping away from positional leadership, you will clearly never step away from leadership. And we look forward to tapping into you for the young people in our program. So thank you.